What are a few of the most questionable decisions people will make? For example, did this firefighter make the right or wrong decision getting her neck tattoo? Or what about this guy who decided to pretend to be a cop? Or how about this guy who was caught by police after he bragged online about his cash? Let's find out, starting with number seven, the neck tattoo. Ex-firefighter Kayana Adams lost her job with the Mobile Fire Department over a tattoo on the back of her head. So what was the big deal about the tattoo? Let's find out. Adams worked at the fire department for nine months before her employer fired her for the new ink. Despite the department's policy against facial or neck tattoos, Adams got a head tattoo anyway. She assumed that since the department had already hired people with prominent neck tattoos after she got the job, then getting one on her head shouldn't be an issue. Also, she knew she could cover it up, so no biggie, right? However, one of her co-workers thought it was a biggie and submitted a complaint about the tattoo, so the department ended up investigating her. She had to sit through an interrogation over the matter, and the fire department concluded that her ink violated their tattoo policy. The city, being reasonable at the time, offered to let it go if she just grew her hair out to hide the tattoo, which she did. But somehow, everyone forgot that growing out hair takes time, and a few weeks later, someone else submitted a complaint. Adams explained that as an African-American woman, she had different textured hair and had no idea how long it would take to grow in enough to cover the tattoo. Then, three months after she got the tattoo, the department updated its policy to prohibit head tattoos completely. A captain at her station took a picture of the back of Adams' head, which showed the tattoo was no longer visible. However, she still lost her job that day, and two captains who defended her were disciplined with one of them getting fired, both of whom are appealing the decision. Adams has since filed a federal discrimination lawsuit against the city of Mobile, alleging that her termination wasn't solely about the tattoo, but was a pretext for discrimination based on her race, gender, religion, and orientation. The lawsuit claims that she faced a hostile work environment and was subjected to harassment, including racist remarks from colleagues. As of the release of this video, the case is ongoing, and Adams is seeking redress for what she claims was unjust treatment treatment during her tenure at the Mobile Fire Rescue Department. So what do you think? Who is making the worst decisions here? The person who is still on probation in a new job that decided to get a tattoo that violates policy because other people did it? Or the people who are making a huge deal about her violating policy even though she was doing everything the department asked her to do to rectify the situation? Let us know in the comment section. Number six, Play Cop. Antoine Tuxin spent 15 years pretending to be a police officer, but his scheme finally fell apart when he called the actual police department for backup. Tuxin pretended to be a U.S. Marshal and had the props to prove it. He had a bite dog, a police vest, a taser, and even a firearm. However, he couldn't keep up the ruse forever. In March of 2022, he tried to arrest a couple women at a restaurant who were attempting to dispute their bill. Of course, the situation escalated since that's not something you'd typically get arrested for, so Tuxin Tuxin made the questionable decision to call Prince George's County Police Department. Tuxin met the officers at the restaurant and flashed them his badge before explaining what went down. But while they were outside talking, something else caught the officers' attention. Amidst all the chaos, Tuxin left his dog inside the restaurant, something law enforcement canine handlers never do. Law enforcement demanded to see Tuxin's credentials again, so in order to combat this, he called his friend, who goes by the name Ninja Rich, to pretend to be his supervisor. So, Ninja Rich who wasn't even a real ninja, arrived on the scene in police-style clothing while officers were arresting Tuxin. He wore a fake uniform and carried a firearm, a radio, handcuffs, and expandable baton. Ninja Rich explained that the dog was an emotional support animal as well as a patrol dog to try and explain away the situation. But that's not something that would ever happen since police dogs go through very different training than support dogs. So even with Ninja Rich's brilliant disguise and excuses, he couldn't stop officers from taking Tuxin and into custody. Law enforcement placed the dog in the care of Prince George's County Animal Services Division. The next day, Ninja Rich turned up at the Animal Services Center, claiming to be a U.S. Marshal, and the center gave him the dog back. This wasn't Tuxin's first stint behind bars. The police imposter was accused of the same offense 
three times before. Back in 2018, he involved himself in a robbery by claiming to be a U.S. Marshal to the victim and responding officers. He was also arrested multiple times between 2005 and 2009 for receiving stolen property. Over the years, he was also convicted for carrying a firearm without a license and for first-degree theft. Upon his arrest, federal officers discovered he had equipped his car with police-style blue and red flashing lights and also carried a fake ID card. Tuxen was ultimately sentenced in July of 2023 to 37 months in federal prison. Seriously, did Tuxen really think he was going to fool actual cops? Like, it seems incredibly obvious that an actual police officer would never just leave a trained police dog anywhere. And then even trying to get your buddy to help you and double down on the authenticity was really stupid. Number five, the convenient excuse. Businessman Lester Hui refused to pay back hundreds of thousands of dollars to a London casino as he claimed he was too drunk to gamble. According to Hui, he had to drink a shot of firewater Mao Tai liquor after losing a drinking game. The alcohol was 65% proof, and by the early hours of the morning, he had at least four shots of it, although some reports claim it was closer to 10. In Hui's version of events, Chris DeLima, the casino's vice president of international marketing, provided the dice and ordered a bottle of Mao Tai to the table before playing the drinking game. However, Delima dismissed Hui's claims and argued that Hui was sober enough to make his own decisions, saying that Hui even drove himself home at the end of the night. But Hui refused to back down, claiming that he was so intoxicated they shouldn't have allowed him to gamble. The casino, Aspinall's Club, whose clients included royalty and celebrities and was only open to exclusive members, of course denied the allegations and demanded Hui pay back his $775 $5,000 in losses. Hui allegedly drank three and a half bottles of wine or champagne that evening, as well as the shots. He signed five pledges for gambling credits throughout this time at the casino. Ultimately, Hui lost $775,000 and handed the casino a blank check for the payout, but it bounced a week later, prompting Aspinall's club to sue him. Both sides refused to back down in court, with Hui doubling down on his accusations of the casino, letting him get too drunk to make informed decisions and the casino denying his claims. So the question here is, was this a dumb strategy or a smart strategy? On one hand, being clearly intoxicated makes it easy for Hui to claim he wasn't able to make any rational decisions and therefore shouldn't have been allowed to gamble. On the other hand, the casino is likely well prepared for people claiming that they were way too drunk to gamble to get out of paying debts, and there would be plenty of video evidence to show exactly how intoxicated he was. Ultimately, the court ruled against Hui, finding that his claim of being too intoxicated to be responsible for his gambling decisions was unconvincing, which is pretty much what we would have guessed. Number four, the conniving clerk. A security camera captured a gas station clerk, Meet Patel, stealing a million dollar lottery ticket from an unsuspecting customer. The unnamed customer, who was apparently very lucky, bought two scratch off tickets that day, one worth $40 and the other worth $1 million. After scratching off the barcode, the customer asked Patel to check and see if the tickets were winners. Store video showed Patel lying that the $1 million had nothing on it. He then took the ticket and placed it in the trash until the customer left the store. Then he took it and put it in his pocket, real smooth like. The store footage then showed him celebrating winning the million dollars. However, for earnings higher than $200,000, winners had to collect their winnings at the Tennessee Lottery's Nashville headquarters. So when Patel tried to claim the prize, employees were suspicious and refused to give him the ticket. Upon further investigation, they discovered that he had stolen it from the rightful winner. So the organization tracked down the unknowing customer to tell him he had won $1 million. Patel was arrested for theft and held on a $100,000 bond. Number three, credible threats. Detroit resident Ariel Moore sent threats to multiple beauty school classmates where she threatened to blast her school. Apparently, she was expelled earlier that day for bad behavior, whatever that means, and didn't take it well. So she thought she'd show everyone what real bad behavior was and sent out some pretty serious threats. Moore sent texts to classmates, including one of an actual firearm she said she was going to use, and made multiple calls to the David Presley School of Cosmetology to make even more threats. So of course, that scared the hell out of everyone and staff canceled classes for the next few days. Fortunately, Moore didn't actually act on anything. The thing was, Moore
Moore already had an arrest warrant for felony identity theft when she was arrested for her new threats. She faced 20 years in prison and fines of up to $20,000. Despite her past legal problems, and she seems to have had many, with a couple of cases moving through the courts, Moore's social media post suggests that she's turned a new leaf. We don't know what ended up happening with the school threats case, but she seems to have moved to Indonesia, where she seems to be committed to being a better person. Hopefully, she figures out some of her issues, and maybe getting expelled and leaving Detroit might have been the best thing for her. Number two, the biased, unbiased judge. Central New York Supreme Court Justice Aaron P. Gall made some racially insensitive comments to police and civilians after an incident at a 2022 party, and it cost her her job. You'd expect to hear this stupid stuff coming from drunk actors or something, but not from a New York Supreme Court justice, right? Gall was a guest at a high school graduation party where groups of uninvited teens suddenly turned up. Fights broke out, and her husband and son were involved in them. The police were called to break it up, and Gall spoke to the police officers when they arrived on the scene. During the 80-minute interaction, the judge said a group of four black teens didn't look smart and that they were definitely not going to business school. Unfortunately for Gall, the cop's body cam caught her entire rant. The New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct ruled that she demonstrated racial bias. Gall disagreed and argued that, despite her comments, she should stay at her post because she didn't actually have a racial bias. But she also repeatedly invoked her position as a judge when she was talking to the the police and said she would always side with them, which shows more bias, right? She was apparently trying to get the police to arrest whomever she felt needed to be arrested and tried to use her position to influence their decisions. However, the commission made her watch back the body cam footage and she desperately hung on to any details that would get her out of trouble. She said she never referred specifically to the black males and testified that she wasn't racist and didn't see color. She also acknowledged that she shouldn't have brought up her status as a judge, but added that everyone there already knew who she was anyway. Which also doesn't make sense because if everyone knew who she was, then why would she need to keep talking about it? Really, why bring it up at all? Despite her unsuccessful attempts to walk back her comments, the commission suspended her without pay. It seems like Justice Gall should have just kept her mouth shut and let the police do their job, doesn't it? It's common knowledge that pretty much all cops have body cameras these days for the protection of everyone, so for her to start blabbing about her opinions, racially or not was quite dumb and as a judge you'd think that she'd never want to show any kind of bias anyway if you're enjoying this video be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how she blew 10 million dollars of her investors money in vegas number one flexing gone wrong Cops arrested three London gangsters after they snapped photos with wads of cash from selling illegal substances around the UK. Why criminals insist on posting this stuff online, we'll never understand. Carl Newell, who thought his messages were encrypted, bragged about his deals on wheels while posing for pictures with rolls of cash and illicit substances. He used the EncroChat platform, which was sort of a WhatsApp-type messenger that was used like crazy by criminals, to give out personal details and share ads for his nose beers. Newell and his cronies, Jack Bayless and Indrik Iconi, bragged on Facebook about the quality and amount of their product, which made it easy for police officers to track them down. Bayless and Kikoni were arrested in August 2020. Newell was a bit harder to catch. He fled to Spain when his buddies were arrested. Four months later, he was arrested and extradited back to the UK. EncroChat has since been dismantled as it was infiltrated by law enforcement back in 2020 leading to thousands of arrests. It's August of 2022, and Sarah Jacqueline King is celebrating her birthday with her husband, her golden doodle, and a few friends. And she's having a splendid time. Her apartment is in a suite at the Wynn Las Vegas, and it's a picture of luxury. There's caviar, cupcakes, frosted with Dior's logo, and even a cake shaped like a Chanel handbag. One of her friends, present at the house, a woman named Amal Obeid Schmid, wishes Sarah a happy birthday, and both women look like perfect best friends. But that 
was last year, and things have now changed. For one, Amal Obeyed Schmidt no longer thinks the world of Sarah. In fact, she now hates Sarah. And that hate is connected to who Sarah Jacqueline King is and how she scammed her way to a celebrity lifestyle in Vegas, spending $10 million of other people's money. Before meeting Sarah King, Amal Obeyed Schmidt lived a relatively calm life as a trauma surgeon in California. One day, she and her husband met Sarah and her husband at the Wynn Hotel in Vegas. Before long, the couple started building an amazing friendship. Soon, Amal and her husband began to host the Kings at their homes in the Los Angeles suburbs. Sarah and her husband also reciprocated and hosted Amal and her husband at a house party in Vegas. However, Sarah's house wasn't some quiet and boring apartment on the corner of the street. It was a huge villa. Amal and her husband were in awe of Sarah's extravagance. After a while, Sarah convinced Amal and her husband to invest in her business, King Family Lending. The business was supposed to provide funds to third-party lenders for wealthy clients. Amal completely bought into the idea, so she and her husband invested their entire life savings. Perhaps the reason why Sarah was so good at selling the idea of a phantom lending business is that it wasn't the first time she'd done it. Sarah King had already successfully scammed LDR International Limited, a British islands firm, into loaning her money for this fake company too. LDR International started extending business loans to the King Family Lending in January 2022. Under the deal they made, King Family Lending was supposed to use the funds for loans for third-party borrowers. In the 10 months that followed, LDR International gave King Family Lending about 97 loans, which totaled over $10 million. But King Family Lending wasn't lending any money to third-party lenders. Instead, Sarah took all that money, rented a villa in Vegas, and gambled all the money away. Because that's what you do when you get $10 million for your lending business. Sarah King's ex-husband is Cameron Pallavi. Pallavi once owned a restaurant in West Hollywood and has made a career out of developing hotels in Morocco. Before Pallavi fled the country in light of his ex-wife's lawsuits, he spoke to LDR International and substantiated all their claims about Sarah's operations. Pallavi was the one who introduced Sarah to LDR International. His rationale was that he wanted her business to grow, and he believed the best way it could grow was for her to get access to credit. The facade of Sarah's life began to crack when Pallavi noticed that some of the bank documents she sent to him about her business were forged. He and his friends began to look closer at the statements and soon found out other inconsistencies that suggested that the documents were fake. The statements were altered to show payments to third-party lenders that were never made. The worst part is that these statements made it to LDR International and the company continued to finance King Family Lending off those fake statements. Sarah didn't depend on just fake statements to defraud LDR International. She also used pictures taken with NFL stars to gain some credibility by showcasing her celebrity clientele. Some of the stars she took pictures with include Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen. Unfortunately for LDR International, the pictures were just pictures and meant nothing. LDR International continued to approve loans for King Family Lending, and Sarah continued to spend those loans. Eventually, she'd spent almost all the money, so she had no choice but to go back to the company and ask for another tranche of loans. When she made these requests for extra cash, she would forge documents about the third-party borrowers the money was supposedly going to. Sarah also lied about the personalities the loans were going to. NFL, NBA, and MLB players, among other very wealthy people. She once said she was giving a loan to a superstar hairstylist for the Kardashians. In the process of perpetrating her fraud, Sarah told LDR International that she'd gotten about $6 million in loan repayments, but had used those funds for other loans. But there were no loans there were no loan repayments. Amal and her husband first met Sarah at the Wynn in Vegas. When they met Sarah, she was dressed in very expensive designers like Dior and Chanel. She gave off an aura of wealth, and Amal was immediately blown away. The couple got talking, and Sarah began to reel them in with interesting tales. She talked about her previous job as a lawyer. She told Amal that she litigated for many years and had put a lot of bad people behind bars. But lawyering was too stressful, so she switched to owning her own lending business. From that day forward, Amal and Sarah became extremely close friends. So close that Amal and her husband even gave Sarah advice about marital issues. In due course, Sarah made her move. She told Amal's husband that she was willing to allow him to invest in her company as a favor. She told him that she only dealt with big clients like professional athletes and billionaires, but she was willing to give him the opportunity because of how close they'd become. Sarah explained that the business would be simple. They invest a certain amount of money, and Sarah would lend that money 
back to athletes and sports stars who didn't want a loan showing up in their bank account. These loans went to purchasing gifts that these stars wanted to hide from their records. The loans would then be paid back with fantastic interest. Amal and her husband were convinced. Sarah was a close friend, and she certainly knew what she was doing. Amal also knew where Sarah shopped, and it was apparent that she was an extremely wealthy person. The pair got so close that when Sarah's birthday came around, Amal decided to get her earrings fashioned in her favorite number, eight. But their relationship went sour a few months later after Amal discovered that Sarah wasn't going to pay back their investment. Sarah signed a number of promissory notes, forged documents proving that she'd paid, and even lied that her ex-husband was preventing her from making the payments. But one thing she didn't do was pay back the investment. All of this came as a rude shock to Amal. She trusted Sarah with her life, and she'd been repaid with the worst sort of betrayal. While all this was going on, someone identifying themselves as Taylor began to send puzzling emails to Sarah's victims from Sarah's email address. Taylor claimed that Sarah was incapacitated and that she'd been empowered by Sarah to reach out and settle some matters. This mysterious Taylor also somehow promised Amal Obeyed Schmid a Lamborghini. The vehicle never came. Another of Sarah's victims, Yumi Sturdivant, also got an email from Taylor, but this letter was filled with insults. Maybe Sarah told Taylor that she didn't just like Sturdivant and that much. Yumi Sturdivant and Sarah King go way back. They met while working at a real estate firm back in 2017 and then decided to quit to start their own marketing agency. They lost touch in 2021 and only reconnected in early 2022. When they reconnected, Sarah immediately offered Yumi an investment opportunity. Sarah explained that by just investing $10,000, she would be able to double the money in three days. It was too good to be true. Yumi didn't want to send the money at first, but she eventually fell for Sarah's lies and sent the money. She never got it back. After Yumi wired the money to Sarah, Sarah started posting pictures she had with Yumi on Instagram. Pictures were a way to continue to emotionally blackmail Yumi, and it showed just how heartless Sarah was willing to be. Another of Sarah's victims is George Poulos. George loaned Sarah around $125,000, and the cash was never repaid. George loaned Sarah the money for interest in a yacht. However, that never materialized. In the process of getting his funds back from Sarah, George realized that he wasn't the only victim. He also learned that Sarah had used the boat she promised him as collateral for several other loans that she didn't even actually own the boat. George did carry out his investigations before loaning Sarah any money. He would visited her home to see the collateral she would put up for the loan, and at the time, they all seemed legit. The last George heard from Sarah King, she was willing to settle. However, that settlement never materialized. Another victim of Sarah's fraudulent business was the founder of a California makeup line, Mana Kadar. The founder of Mana Kadar Cosmetics is now alleging that King persuaded her to part with Sarah $62,000. Apparently, Sarah used her position as a lawyer to gain Miss Kadar's confidence and then convinced her to invest cash into King Family Lending through loans. To make the offer extra juicy, Sarah first put up her engagement ring as collateral, then claimed she needed it back, so she offered an Admars Piguet watch instead. Of course, it turned out that the watch was fake. Sarah King's exploits in the world of multidimensional fraud only got popular in 2022, but that doesn't mean she hadn't been playing the game long before then. Mayor Casillas Berger was working at a Californian beauty store when she became friends with Sarah. One day, Sarah invited Mayor over to the exclusive Balboa Bay Club and asked her to become a personal assistant. In time, Mayor began to notice that Sarah was always on the run from her business partners. They always wanted to speak to her or book an appointment, and she always found a way to wriggle out of it. In the meantime, Mayor moved in with Sarah and started traveling the world with her. During this period, Mayor noticed that Sarah might not sleep for days and would leave the house in the middle of the night. She also shut her phone off fairly regularly and went no contact for days. This was very puzzling behavior to Mayor. However, the puzzle was solved when Sarah scammed her as well. In November 2021, Sarah took $5,000 from Mayor during a work trip to Vegas, abandoned her at a casino hotel, and then ghosted her. Apart from collecting $5,000, Sarah also used Mayor's credit card to purchase first-class tickets to Hawaii. As expected, Sarah never repaid the money for the tickets. Despite constantly being on the run from multiple creditors, Sarah still managed to live a life of absolute luxury. Mayor frequently accompanied Sarah to expansive garages where the most luxurious cars were parked. Sarah claimed that these vehicles, some of which included Bentleys and Rolls Royces, belonged to her. She also went on shopping sprees at designer stores and took weekly chartered flights to a private airport in Las Vegas where she claimed to have high-level business meetings. Most of the payments for these expenses were made in cash, and Mayor, her assistant, was tasked 
tasked with not only basic assistant work, but also with picking bags of cash up from the bank. But Sarah wasn't just interested in money. She also sought status in her quest for wealth. That's why she got herself into the Gen Next Foundation, a conservative-leaning Newport Beach-based nonprofit. However, members of the foundation saw right through her act. They quickly realized that although Sarah looked like she had a lot of money, she behaved in a way that suggested that she was just nouveau rich. Sarah once asked the members of the foundation, who were at lunch at the time, if they wanted to see her new Bentley, the hallmark of someone who recently came into wealth and was still managing the luxury that came with it. While Sarah wasn't good at blending in with high society, she was expert at coming up with excuses. She gave so many excuses that it's really hard to keep track of all of them. When George Pulo started searching for her to collect his money, she had Mayer tell George that her grandmother had passed. At the time, Mayer started seeing just how fake Sarah was and even thought that Sarah was somewhat sick in the head. What allowed Sarah to get away with these excuses was that she was good at getting people to believe her. She had so much charisma that people believed anything she said, no matter how insane it was. Aside from making excuses, Sarah also loved loved playing with people. Many times, she gave Mayer little tests to see if she could make something happen. Once, she sent Mayer to a high-end restaurant in Orange County that wouldn't do takeout orders to collect a salad for lunch. Mayer complained that the restaurant didn't do takeout orders, but Sarah insisted that she make it happen. Surprisingly, Mayer did make it happen. However, she had to tell the hostess that Sarah was a psychopathic boss first. On their last trip to Vegas, Mayer saw Sarah lose $40,000 playing at the high state roulette table in 15 minutes flat. Once the 40 40,000 bucks was exhausted, Sarah asked Mayer to borrow $5,000. Mayer obliged as she wrongly believed that she would be reimbursed. That night, Sarah put Mayer to another test. She asked Mayer to get her stuff from a room in the hotel despite not having a key. That meant that Mayer had to find a guard that liked her enough and believed her enough to open the doors with an extra key. It seemed impossible, but Mayer eventually did it. When Mayer brought the luggage to meet Sarah, she didn't even acknowledge her or pretend like she'd completed some important task. She simply took the bags and told Mayer to to go on leave. So, Mayer went on leave and stopped hearing from Sarah. When she started texting Sarah for the money she was owed, Sarah's answer was simple. She didn't owe Mayer anything, as she'd taken Mayer out and paid for a lot of dinners for her, so they were even Steven. Of course, this affected Mayer profoundly. She'd built a very close sister relationship with Sarah. It was the worst sort of betrayal. So, what's Sarah King up to today? No one knows. We do know that she's still somewhere in Las Vegas, gambling away money borrowed from others, and maybe taking taking some more pictures with important people. We also know that about six casinos have banned her and are on the lookout for her. Beyond that, no one knows much else. Her creditors are still asking questions. No one knows when or if they'll get their answers. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have. Free fast food for life or free groceries for life.